when you were growing up and starting out, who were you in, who were you sort of influenced by, and who were your favourite, you know, some of your favourite directors and films? Um, I think um, the early shorts, because I've not seen some of those for, uh, you know, well over ten years, and you know, some of them, uh, I can't remember the last time I watched the, the Dancer Connection or you know any of those films, but I think I was, um, I used to watch, I didn't have many. Uh, videos, but I had a, quite a few Scorsese videos, and I think Mean Streets was a big influence. And, and I think I bought a, a Scorsese short film compilation called Scorsese by Four, mm. which had some of his early college films. And I, I would probably uh, say that he was my lecturer at college, Martin Scorsese, because I used to watch I watched Mean Streets every day for about six weeks, <laughs> and uh, I kind of realised that. Um, Although I'd not grown up with a, a, a kind of godfather background, I'd grown up with small time criminals around me and, and lots of petty <coughs> crime and they actually were amazing people and, and it kind of gave, watching Mean Streets basically for six weeks, once a day, every day for six weeks, gave me the confidence over and over and over of watching that film that there was a beauty in the minute in a way and, uh, and that, you know I was a, an expert in the minute at that point in time so um, it gave me the confidence to to focus on the people I'd grown up with and I'd fallen in love with that weren't ever Hollywood they were never heading for a Hollywood story but in a way where's the money Ronnie and the da you know because Tank Bullock is based on this fucking loose cannon farmer from your Topsy Turn <laughs> and, you can, and you can turn them into a cop or you know whatever you want to turn them into it, it kind of uh, I'll be dead honest, it was Scorsese, it was literally Scorsese and nobody else for a few years. And now it's different, you know, I love a massive range of uh, filmmakers and I go through phases where, you know, I'll sort of see somebody's film and then I'll just have to go on Amazon and everywhere and buy everything they've ever made and watch it. And I was going to ask, who do you particularly rate who's working now? Scorsese, everybody seems at some point, you know, Van Morrison I love as a musician, but they go from an electronic phase where you kind of go, oh, why have you used that keyboard on everything? It's like ruined an album, you know. And But Werner Herzog um, was somebody that I kind of came across who managed even now just still just sticks his fingers up to the establishment and uh, is still making whatever he wants to make. And that's kind of, you know, he's like a Charles Bukowski character, you know. He's like refuses to bend to anybody. And, and he's managed to go, you know, there's a brilliant documentary I saw about him where he gets fucking shot. In the middle of filming a, an interview, I think it's with Mark Comeau. It is with Mark Comeau, yeah. yeah. and he gets shot in the middle of a documentary. And Mark Comeau, the interviewer, is trying to stop the interview and going, "You've just been fucking shot." <laughs> going, oh, this is just the puncture. We like, you know, like <laughs> mental German guy. And I just remember thinking, "Fuck, you know, I'm more like that than than." Uh... And he was still in Hollywood Hills, so he's managed to go to Hollywood. This guy, and still retain who he is and you know you look at his early films it's that's uh, the dream for me is to be able to keep making personal work um, everything he did it was kind of like I've got 70 quid and you know and I want to make this film that basically on Hollywood would like he basically shot a film on a boat you know which would like you know by modern standards is like a 50 hundred million dollar film and he just literally did it with some stolen stock and a camera and took all these people and like, nearly killed everyone every time he made a film someone died it was like <laughs> <laughs> he's there as a legend yeah um, and uh, yeah so it, I think you know Scorsese was the one that really uh, I was able to sit with my video player when all my mates had bogged off and you know wherever they'd gone to all over the world and I sat and watched his films every day and obviously I, I like you know Mike Lee Ken Loach and various Channel 4 films and Made in Britain and things that touched me um, but I, th I, th I don't think, think I realised till I got to about 18 and 19 that three or four of my favourite films were by the same person because I loved Mean Streets, I loved Raging Bull, mm. I loved Taxi Driving. And you kind of go, actually, it's all the same friggin' person. But I, you know, I didn't, I didn't watch films like that as a kid. I just used to watch them and love them. And um, I'm sending a, um, a box set of my films down to this house angel who my dad knows, who actually lent me. He had a pirate video collection, and when I was 11 or 12. My dad had, um, on a Saturday, wouldn't, you know, basically we'd have time at home and had this guy, you'd go over to his house and he had a book with all of his videos in. There were lots of Clint Eastwood films and Rambos and, and I'd go over on a Saturday morning and get these films and sit and watch four or five films with my dad. So I didn't care who'd made them. 
and then I got to like college doing photography for, for the first time and uh, and someone went, yeah, they're all Martin Scorsese films and I went, oh, okay, I like him then, you know, it's <laughs> one of them. So. Obviously location is extremely important to you as a filmmaker and obviously we're talking about round here. What do you think essentially shooting in your own backyard brings to a film? What sort of qualities do you think? Um, well, Nottingham was, uh, although it's much bigger than where I was from, um, when I lived in Snenton, it just the people in Snenton would oh you know there was a pub with a bare knuckle fighter on the fucking roof. I remember thinking this is familiar, you know, this is kind of they had a, a pub called the Bendigo, and there was loads of just a mix of students that were there. But the people of Snenton would, felt like I could have been where I lived, but I could never make a film where I lived because I knew too many people. Whereas Snenton gave me this. Uh, anonymity yet at the same time reminded me of home so I was able to use it as a kind of backdrop um, but then I had complete freedom until I got burgled that was um, and someone saw me with a camera and then I got burgled about six times in a month um, and uh, and that's why that guy Graham was so special because I got burgled uh, my house, you know, I come back one day my door was kicked in and the camera was missing with the first tape of Where's the Money Ronnie I'd shot on it, and obviously in them days I used to leave the tape in the cameras, left it in the front room. And I'd, I'd been bought to play. I, I'd never ever, apart, I think apart from once I'd heard about someone's house getting burgled. Um, and then obviously you come to a city centre and you're kind of like, okay, you keep a baseball bat and they have a bit of rug you can jump out the window with. And you know, <laughs> Rapunzel, like, oh, that woman hair. <laughs> I sort of adapted a few little, then you know, I tweaked a few bits. Um, and um, but, but ultimately it was this... Um, it was able to sort of, and, and I kind of, I, as you'll notice, I acted in loads of the early films because I, um, I wasn't acting because I wanted to be an actor. I acted because I wanted other people to feel confident to act. And I'd been on a, an acting course with Paddy Considine, and he, he used to just run rings around me. And I realised I couldn't act. And I also wanted to be a musician. And then I met Gavin Clark, who writes a lot of music. My films were, well, I'm not going to be a singer. I can't be an actor because they're both ridiculously talented. And, and they kind of found that directing was, was the thing. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously it was many years before I kind of came to that place, but um, going to Snenton, something about that thing of being left on my own on the dole and, uh, and started working as a volunteer at Intermedia and getting a camera, um, you know, the gods were kind of, you know, the heavens opened and I just started, I think, I think that would have been a really, really boring match on uh, Wimbledon, because on the very first Where's the Money Runny I made by myself, you can actually hear Martina Navratilova all over playing someone in the final. It's like the wankest easy win. And I think that's why I made the film, because I remember thinking, oh, this is over. You know, so, <laughs> this? And I just started shooting myself with a towel on the head, and the rest is kind of history. So. You're known for getting incredibly naturalistic, um, authentic performances out of your cast, and um, incredibly naturalistic dialogue as well. How, does, how, does, how do you get that? I think it's because I, I, I was afraid of acting and um, and I knew I could do it by myself I could like I think we're all capable every single person is capable you know the conversations I have ones that you know like I wish I'd fucking said something so I'm in my car like running over some car rage I should have had on somebody where I got a clever comment you know we're all capable of being Travis Bickle but we tend to do it a little bit delayed and uh, and so my school of thinking is that um, on film a lot of the time the um, there's like a time limit, a massive time constraint. It's like we've got to shoot this. It's you know you've got to get this done by the end of the day. We've got to do five pages today, or do this and that and the other. And when I made those um, early films, I used to just steal tapes from boots that were 90 minutes long and have loads of them and just kind of go oh, fucking just keep going and just we'll get it right at some point. And and um, and I think because I I learnt my confidence um, through acting in my own films, I realised I could actually act but only under my own guidance. Whereas if someone had said to me, read this script, land on that X, be funny now, you freak, you know, and <laughs> dance around, monkey boy, you know, it was like, I couldn't do that, but I could do it my own way. And so, uh, you know, so then the early films, like, you know, meeting people like Vicky McClure and Andrew Shim, and you meet these kids at the workshops, all, all your job to do is then, is to kind of make them feel like, um, you're doing a school play in a way. It's like putting on a, you're picking talented people to start with, mm. but you're kind of going, um, you know, there's no pressure. That wasn't a bad take. Let's just try it this way. Let's just try it that way. 
and it was all out of necessity to make myself feel confident as an actor. Uh, and I realised anybody in this room, anybody in the world can give a performance. Not everyone's meant to be an actor, you know, but everyone can give at least one performance. And I sort of thought, well, at the moment, all I've got around me is, you know, uh, there's a single mum lives next door, there's a couple just moved in up the road, there's a, a lad who was at college, he's a stoner, but he's a really lovely Glaswe, you know, and, and at that point it was just pull whatever resources were in around the, the time. So when I've made, um, I think I've made about 15, 12 or 15 shorts, and, and some of them were tiny. Uh, and uh, and when Where's the Money Ronnie went into a film competition and Stephen Woolley saw it, he said, have you got anything else? And I sent him all these other films in which had all the same people in and I said, I'll do a feature film but I want these people in it. Mm. And he kind of said, well the deal in film is you could probably get away with them if you pick a star, you know, and I kind of, which was which was right though at the time and, and, and he said, is there anyone who you like? You know, you'd have to pick just a jerk from America, you know. Uh, and I said, well, I, I've got this idea about this guy that ran a football club when I was a kid, uh, and, but I want to do it about a boxing club because I love Raging Bull and, and I said I, I love Bob Hoskins and so he said if you pick Bob Hoskins and you can take all your friends and put them together, it might just work and, and that's what we did. I, I remember doing some auditions for 24-7 in a flat in London, you know, which was right out of my comfort zone and, uh, and yeah, some people like bursting out crying and telling me all the darkest secrets and, you know, I wasn't built for counselling in those days. So, you know, uh, yeah. but generally as a rule of thumb, the people that we kind of work with, you tend to be from the same flock if you like and it's, uh, I don't struggle too much with that. On the subject of This is England, is that, is that still your most autobiographical film to date you think? Yeah, it is, yeah. I think so. I mean, Dead Man's Shoes was, uh, was made from a personal place, but um, This Is England was, um, yeah, was, was me, if you like, and then obviously it, 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 was, it was me and a group of friends I knew, but then as everyone came in and started adapting their characters, like the person that um, Lol became in the series, or Stephen Graham kind of becomes, they started off as people in my head and then they became other people. That, were, that came from the cast, you know. So, um, but but then uh, when you say in your head, do you mean fictionalised or your memory? No memory, yeah. yeah. So there was a guy. There was a guy called. Uh, there was a couple. My posh and Bex in your Toxter were called Donk and Lol. The first names I ever saw spray painted on a wall was Donk and Lol, and they were the celebrity couple of your Toxter team. You know, <laughs> kids, like, leather jackets, and I remember just thinking, "Fuck it." I was like nine, and I remember asking this woman Lol to marry me when I was nine, and she said. <laughs> I'm 17, you know, you, you still want to marry me when you're 17, I might do. I was being bullied uh, as a kid. I've got, my dad's a really hard bloke and um, and when I was started getting bullied at school, I was like Tomo in uh, This Is England and um, it, it, basically when I first started the middle school, my dad had, um, it's quite public knowledge, like, but he'd found a girl's body in um, I was accused of murder and stuff like that. And they, they, ultimately, years later, they found the bloke that did it. But there was like a stigma when you know you go to school and you're nine or ten, and you fucking shaggy head little kid with a jumper with squirrels on and all that. I was kind of like, I was ultimately like, um, I got picked on a fair bit because I sort of started school and people thought my dad was this fucking serial killer. And uh, and so I, I think at about eleven years old, I was. Um, I come back through town one day, and, and it's, like all great uh, fucking youth movements, it happens literally, not even overnight, like one second you're looking at a bus shelter and everyone looks the same, and the next second they've shaved their hair, they're wearing docks, and you're like, what the fuck is that? They look ace, you know, what are they doing? I'd like to be like that, you know, it was like, and so I've got mates that were into Kevin Keegan, and you know, mates wanted to bat like Ian Botham, and I was like looking at these skinheads, because I always had a need in me, to uh, to be stronger, and I saw this strength in these kids, and I and I attached myself to them. So and I don't class being a skinhead as um, as actually belonging to me genuinely. The music, the reggae music, does, but I was a plastic skinhead. I was too young to be a real skinhead, you know. And uh, it wasn't until the Stone Roses that I truly fell in love with music, you know, um, or I truly had my own uh, moment, but. Yeah, the, the skinhead thing was about being 
brutalised at school and then all of a sudden coming back after fucking summer term with a shaved head and a machete in your bag and knuckle duster. So, you know, honestly, I'm not joking. It was like, and I was hanging around with savages and I, I became a bit of a lunatic for a while and it ultimately wasn't me and obviously that's what This Is England is about. That when that kid who thinks he's this little hard nut is exposed to something genuine and brutal and, and awful that he's going to realise how far away he is from it. But, you know, that, that's kind of what dragged me into it, to be honest. Although one of the things we were quite careful of the film to do was to separate, or to explain the fact that Skins wasn't a wall-to-wall -wall racist movement. I mean, it had that element, but there was also an element that it wasn't. Yeah, well, I had a Woody and a Combo. Um, the Combo character that was uh, part of my life passed away recently. Um, and the, the Woody guy is still Woody, in a way. He still lives in the Toxic Term, and, you know, you know the, the guy that he was kind of based on was a Marine and was fucking amazing guy but it, it, and there was a, a guy that my sister went out with as well that I think Woody was sort of split between them that would tell me about the fashion and you know I'd come out in a pair of Wranglers with some like monkey boots on and, and a polo top out of like the great universal catalogue that wasn't Fred Perry and he'd go fucking hell kid what's that you're wearing that's similar it's uh, you know and he'd, he would basically tell me you have to wear Levi red tag you have to wear at least eight whole docks, not three whole monkey boots. <laughs> Hello. That's my seaside anthem. Um, and, uh, yeah, and, and so I was educated before um, before I became, you know, before I was introduced to the, the sort of national front and all those things with the guy that came out of prison. I was, um, I, was take, I used to go on, it was lovely, quite romantic really, I used to go on a bus to Stafford and we'd go to this record shop in Staffan and not only would I buy sort of, you know, Samarap and Toots and the Maytals and Desmond Decker and I'd also buy like The Who and, you know, this guy was kind of showing me everything so I was really lucky that I got a, a genuine education about the original skinhead movement and, and about the fact that, you know, working class white and black lads had worked together on the docks and, you know, this, basically this whole thing was like a working class uniform so I knew it um, but then obviously as the 80s progressed and uh, unemployment progressed to three and a half, four million, then you, you got all these people coming out of the woodwork as they do now, you know, um, in rough places, Leeds, Bradford, and, and they sort of get these little strongholds. Um, and, you know, I was like 11 at the time, so I, I don't hold it against myself. I, I listened to some of that stuff because I was in a, a, in a place with without any ethnic minorities within it, you know, but uh, I went to a meeting and pretty soon saw them, you know, skinheads beating up uh, innocent people and sort of realised it was bullshit pretty soon, but uh, yeah, if for a lot of people all they ever got was the, um, the secondary skinhead movement and it wasn't very pretty. Um, is there going to be a This Is England 90? Um, if there is, what, what can you tell us about it? Um, well, I'm just about to do some rehearsals with uh, with the, some of the cast uh, in December, and uh, hopefully it'll you know it'll happen. And um, I've got combo. If it happens, combo kind of comes out of prison from the manslaughter charge that he will have served for Vicky's uh, for Lowell's dad, and uh, we'll come back to the community. And um, yeah, I've, there's there's quite a few twists and turns in there. You've obviously got the the birth of the Stone Roses and the whole Manchester scene and that will, for the younger members of this England cast, that will be their kind of moment. So whereas obviously the older members are moving into having children and uh, the younger members, as in my uh, era, will have their summer of love. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, and I never completely dare say in case some, you know, something doesn't happen, but it, it's looking good. And you've got a new project one developing something about Tommy Simpson. Yeah, uh, there's a, a local, a brilliant local uh, writer um, called Billy Ivory, who's also a Knox County fan, which goes a long way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and Billy is uh, me and Billy nearly nearly wrote a, a, a version of the King of the Gypsies together a few years ago. And then for one thing and another, I went off and did something, and he did something, and, and he's just written me the second draft of. Tommy Simpson. Um, for anyone that doesn't know, Tommy Simpson was a cyclist from North Nottinghamshire that was BBC Sports Personality of the Year in '65, 
and um, in 67 they thought it was going to be the year that he might win the Tour de France. He was the first um, Englishman to wear the yellow jersey. He was, he was an exceptional sort of sportsman, but a kind of a bit like skinheads in a way, and it had been airbrushed from history because when he died on Mount Von Two and they did an autopsy, he, was, he had a lot of amphetamines in his body and various things that were quite uh, run of the mill for the time when cycling was kind of going on, but it, it, until recently he'd kind of been airbrushed out of the system. And I saw a documentary about him on, this is kind of how films come to me now really, is that I'll, I'll see something and be moved by it and, uh, and, and kind of, you know, want to make a film about it generally. So that, that's kind of, so, you know, Shane Meadows on the uh, Tour de France wouldn't normally strike people as <laughs> a, a natural progression, but for me, when I read his and saw the documentary, it was like, it was like a raging bull story, someone who was in control of their own destiny and had all the ability to be one of the greats, yet was, you know, sort of uh, in control of their own destruction rather than their own success, and so I was really moved by it, and he was also from not very far away, you know, so... So I was quite surprised when Shane Meadows and Stone Roses, because I always associate with you, I guess, from this as England with more of a kind of rock steady and Trojan kind of background and thing. So when the Stone Roses came out, oh, okay, that's happening. How, how did that come about? Well, I, I think the thing is, I've always looked older than I than I am, and so I think <laughs> I was, uh, I had a, like a moustache when I was about twelve. So people probably thought I was a genuine skinhead, but uh, in actual fact, there was like a, a nine-year-old kid in there, you know, um, who wanted to watch He-Man. Um, <laughs> But the, the, the Stone Roses thing came about because I'm a massive fan and I met Ian Brown one day. There was a, a Banksy, I've been invited to a Banksy exhibition in Bristol and uh, I went down with my wife to this exhibition and um, I, you know, I just basically went to this exhibition and Ian Brown was there and I said to my wife, Jesus, I'm like a massive Ian Brown fan, you know, I'm like Stone Roses and, and Ian Brown and it was one of them things where you kind of go, gee, you know. I'm going to have to go and see, even if he just thinks I'm a jerk, I'm going to have to go and say hello and what I mean. I went and introduced myself and I was really lucky because him and his crew had watched Dead Man's Shoes about three weeks before on his tour bus. So it was like when I said my name, he kind of registered it and, and it turned out a load of his mates. It was like one of their favourite films and I got a bit of an in with him, you know, and uh, so I got to swap numbers and appear like a serial killer. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then just kept in touch with him a bit and... <coughs> you know, on and off, just having conversations. I met him at a couple of various things. Went to see him play live, and uh, and then um, we should do a film. And it wasn't completely locked down at that point. But he was saying, um, you know, if we do one, we'd like you to do it. And I think a few weeks later, I went up to their secret hideaway in uh, Warrington, Manchester. Right? I remember thinking, with because remember, the, normally when I'm making a film or finishing a film, I, I've not got enough time to see me on kids or anything. But I. So I wouldn't normally overlap projects like that, but I just thought, I said, when I was about to start the Tommy Simpson project with Billy, and I sort of rang Billy and said, look, if this comes off, I'm going to have to do it, because I missed this gig in uh, 1990, I never saw the Stone Roses play live, and it's like the biggest regret in my life, and I'm going to have to do it if it comes off. And me and the producer went up and I said, uh, if we just go tonight and they tell us to piss off, at least we might have heard a rehearsal or something, you know. <laughs> and it was, it was a bit like that, we were like, every week, we, you know, we've seen one rehearsal, maybe we'll get to see this, or maybe we'll... And I never really took it for granted, I never thought it would actually happen, because I knew they were quite a... Uh, you know, no one knew whether they, they were ever going to actually get to the Heat and Park shows. <laughs> um, them themselves, I don't think, I think, when they walked in, out on stage and, you know, in front of 80,000, 90,000 people at Eaton Park, it was like, uh, on the night it was touch and go, you know? <laughs> so, um, yeah, it was just one of them meant to be things, I think. I think we should take some questions from the floor, but before I do, I just want to ask my final question, which is, um, you seem to be an incredibly compulsive filmmaker, um, obviously given your, your dozens and dozens of shorts that you've made, for one thing. If you couldn't do this, you know, if, if filmmaking was taken out of your hands or some reason, what would or could you do? Uh, I think before my children, I probably, I don't know, I would have probably exploded, I think. But, uh, um, but now I've got kids, I could probably survive if I was like, uh, if it was taken from me, you know, and I couldn't do it for whatever reason. But, uh, but yeah, 
there's nothing else I can do very well. I think um, I probably can't work in the kitchen here, maybe, and because <laughs> I, I get to do my acting with my two-year-old. Because uh, at the moment I'm just a fox in the house, I'm like an abandoned fox. <laughs> and he has this freaking massive basket of plastic food. He has to give it all to me. And I have to like basically I try and watch the telly, eat. <laughs> fucking, and I have to hold all of it all up on the top. And if I drop a donut or a plastic tomato, I have to wait until it's loaded back on and walk around with him. So uh, I'm fulfilling my acting promise. Uh, but uh, directing wise, there's, there's nothing else I can do. I tried everything. I, I, I did judo for a week. I did, you know, making cakes. I've tried, you name it, I've done it. Um, and that was the, you know, the light came on when I made films. Um, obviously, once you have children, you, you kind of realise that you could, you know, you could survive without it. But, um, I, you know, I don't want to massively, if possible. Should we take some questions? Anyway. Yes, please. Have you still got the Datsun? <laughs> no, it wasn't mine. That was that guy's robbing. But I did buy a 120Y uh, off the back of it. And it just like every time I went for the MOT, it was like 40 grand. <laughs> like they just re welded a new car around the old pedal. So I said, the pedal's fine. I'm just going to re weld you a brand new Datsun um, from baked bean tins around what used to be your old accelerator pedal. But my, my dream car is a Toyota Celica um, RA22 1970s. It's like a two, it looks like a sports car, but it's really slow and quite, <laughs> quite inefficient. But uh, yeah, so yeah, the Datsun was, was, I wanted a Celica at the time, but this lad on this photography course had the Datsun and he could drive really well, couldn't he? I thought he was, yeah, remarkable actually. Every skid he did work first time. <laughs>
this lad uh, went to um, I think Nicaragua to make a documentary with about 17 grand and just stayed there. Um, and, uh, and, and one of the so they, they'd literally given this money to this film and, and he'd gone abroad and just went back to live with his family and just like lived on it and didn't come back with the film and, it, and one night I was showing where's the money Ronnie to the people that were in it and this guy his name was Jeff Bagger from Sheffield uh, University coming and he must have watched it through the little square window in Intermedia and watched the film and he I think he was one of the people that actually championed my film. He talked to me, should give this guy a chance, but got ruled out. And he called me to one side that night and said, uh, you know, look, I'll be honest with you, we had this film, I wished we'd fund your jaws, this one's gone, we've lost the money. Um, would you, if I gave you a bit of money to finish it, would you pretend, in a way, that you sort of were originally part of it? And I sort of said, how much money? And he was like, <laughs> he was like well, how much do you need? And I said, well, I don't know, as much as I can have. And, uh, and we, we sort of wangled a deal. And uh, I think I got a couple of thousand quid to do an online and to put some titles on it and stuff like that. And then it got screened. And it was screened as part of the season, but it had never really been made as part of the season. Um, so I think, in a way, a lot of people would say, oh, yeah, you should have stuck to your guns and this and that. But the bottom line is I got the thing on telly. And then that got put into a competition, and then the person that saw the competition was a producer who was pretty famous, and then I was making 24-7 six months later, so it's kind of, the advice for me was always keep pushing, keep making, and if you see a window of opportunity, not obviously bend over and pull your pants off, but <laughs> if you see a chance, um, then snatch it, you know. This is England 88. There's a really specific couple of scenes with Blob. Yeah. Where I've never quite seen like postnatal depression played as it is. Yeah. As it is real. Where did that come from? From from you and from Vicky? I mean, is Vicky still with us? Is she smoking? <laughs> <laughs> do you want to speak, Vic, or do you? You go first. <laughs> I mean, we, we do, like, I mean, I, I got some personal sort of, you know, experience of it through my family. Um, and when, wherever we rehearse anything, I mean, Vicky was put through the ringer, really, to get to the place that she kind of got to in This Is England of 88, almost to the point that we almost fell out as friends, you know, and uh, she was kind of isolated from people. It wasn't like a, oh, you know, read a college book about, you know, it was... It was learn and look at this, but at the same time she was also isolated, which is one of the horrible sides of directing sometimes, that when you want to, a bit like the rape scene in 86, there's kind of no way of, um, there's no nice way of doing it, and if you're going to do it at all, you might as well make it as repulsive and as awful as it should be. Um, and uh, and that was one of those instances where Vicky started, and I, and I arranged the whole shoot of the, the series around Vicky starting much later than everybody else. So she didn't see anybody. Um, she lived on her own, and um, she wasn't allowed to see anybody. And when she did bump into one of the cast and chose to talk to them, when she knew she shouldn't have, even though you know she was just she was fucking <laughs> bored out of the tree, I then moved her even further out. And then, so this is the awful thing. This is the it's a very ugly, ugly side. Of when you believe in something and you believe that it's going to benefit the ultimate story, you 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 almost have to ride roughshod over things that, as a human being, you wouldn't normally do. And so Vicky um, was put in a place where she felt like that, and also, um, you know, she, through she hadn't had any children herself, but through other people. And the woman that was playing the nurse, Helen, who'd got four or five children, it was a mixture of science and um, very rough, creative smacking. Um, <laughs> but uh, Vicky can probably <coughs> a wee now, she tells her a bit. Um, oh, it's hard to explain because it's very kind of unique. From, literally from the rehearsals, there's so much that goes off before we even start shooting. So. Um, you know, Shane will rehearse for a good few months, really, before we, we get anywhere. So we were saying outside, actually, it's like, we'll rehearse things that you'll never even see. So 
you know, me and Gadget would do a scene and no one would ever expect, you know, Lol and Gadget would ever really have that moment. Um, but it's, you know, that is a big part of the process and he really does put you through the ringer and, you know, like Shane said, I haven't got children, I didn't really have, you know, an idea of postnatal depression in that, in that respect, but I certainly felt very low and, you know, there's a lot of things that Shane does and the cast and everybody around you does to help you get to that place. Um, there was a scene where I was on the bus and I'm crying and it sort of turns into the montage on the way to go and see Combo. And that was the day that me and Shane had fallen out and, you know, part of me was crying because of what we were going through as much as the audience don't know it. Um, you know, it was a really upsetting. We didn't talk, did we, that day? Yeah, it was horrible. It was really horrible. And I, and I, that was the closest I've ever come to kind of just thinking, fuck, you know, what am I doing this for, you know? And when you see the result on the screen and you know why you were kind of doing it, you kind of go, um, it was, it was kind of worth, worth it, it. And, you know, and, um, you know, the series goes on and wins something on this, and then you kind of pack something about, but then if it doesn't and it all flops, you can, you, you know, it's like anything, it's like any, um, when you're managing anything, you know, you sometimes you get it right, sometimes you don't, but I, I knew at the time you can't. Uh, you, you have to draw on um, what's inside somebody that's maybe slightly similar, you know, but ultimately I, I'd kind of witnessed something and, and, and I, I spoke to people, but I'd seen some something from my own side and, you know, you can workshop that, but at the same time Vicky just had to be, uh, had to be sort of pulled away from everybody else. So this is England, it's a very rewarding job for those that are in the happy gang. And then they're all going out and they're going to VIP areas, you know, and they're getting picked up in big stupid pink cars <laughs> and they're disobeying every rule that there, that there is to disobey. And then Vicky is literally obeying every, she's learning every line and such and such and then she gets punished for something minuscule, which at the time was really hard to do, but, you know, it's kind of uh, something that kind of had to be done to make sure that, so when she turns up in those scenes, half of it was... It actually didn't work, did it? Can you remember? We had to reshoot. Which proved that you were right, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we'd, we'd shot um, a scene with me and Woody because I'd bumped into Joe, you know, accidentally. Again, <laughs> you know, <laughs> one um, <laughs> so it's on camera. <laughs> um, yeah, so we shot this scene and it didn't work and it was because you know that sort of shock connection wasn't there and there was a lot of elements that Shane wanted and um, he came to the edit and it, it just wasn't right and we did we had to go back and reshoot it which is always even harder but then I think that tension as well helped and yeah. you know he, he just knows what he's doing on every level you've got to do <laughs>
and uh, and then I heard Ludovico in Audi. Uh, this is going back to what 2005, something like that. So Ludovico in Audi now is everywhere, you know. And uh, on the Apprentice, they smack him on, and you know, every time anyone sort of starts to even slightly be sad, they're cracking it on everything. <laughs> but you know, this this guy, you know, basically was unheard of at the time. I heard this piece of music and. And I, you know, at the end of a piece, I thought, "Fucking hell, that's it. That's that's what I need." It's a skinhead film with classical music. You know, it's like, and I got it. And then at the end of it, they said Ludovico and Audi. The piece was Una Mattina. And then I, and I, have you got a pen, mate? Oh, I'm working it. Fucking. So I try to remember this name all the way to Toronto. <laughs> when I land in Toronto and get out the plane, I make him take me straight to a record store. I'm asking for uh, Ambassador Signore. That <laughs> <laughs> song is called Cinema Piss. <laughs> Honestly, I just couldn't have got it anywhere going, never heard of it, and I'm going, uh, Gino Vassetti, uh, lukewarm water. <laughs> and and this, is, this is a true story. When I get back from Toronto, and I go home and I'm just thinking, fuck, I've lost it. There was a piece of music on the radio. And it wasn't like, you know, like now you've on the internet and you remember what channel, you know, what radio you were on and you just go on and go, classic FM, roughly this time, you know, it wasn't like that, I just couldn't remember the name of it. Um, and then I went into HMV, I was thinking I'm going to have to go and look for something else, and I put the radio on, um, and I thought I'll just whack classic FM on, it was fucking on. <laughs> the exact same song, honestly, like literally, and I went into HMV in Burton-on-Trent, and I was like, you know, Ludo Vico and Audi. <laughs> Una Martina. Yes. Yeah. And I went in and picked it was like front of the rack, took it back, spoke to my producer, so I've got the name of the guy, find out where he is, I want to meet him. Mark said he lives in Milan. And the next day I was on a flight to Milan and I went over to and I took a cut of the film over and I took Una Martina that night and laid loads of it into the film. I said it isn't perfect and he watched it and he just as he was watching it. He wrote something in his head and he played it back to me and I cried my fucking socks off and then that was kind of... And then I went back and told Channel 4 and showed them and they hated it. <laughs> we wanted Quadrophenia, you've given us like Dane Lord City. <laughs> and they hated it right the way through. To, uh, they hated it right until the premiere. Like not just Channel 4, everyone that funded it would sit in a meeting and just go, you're ruining the film. You know, you're basically ruining the film, it doesn't work to have something so tender and something so personal on a film it just doesn't work and then we went to like screen it in Toronto and I stuck to my guns and we played it in Toronto and I remember um, one of the heads of Channel 4 like looked round because we'd all got locked in because when you see a film you've seen it six times and you see it again and then suddenly it changes it can be quite off-putting and they watched it with an audience who were going with it and this woman turned around to me was a head of Channel 4 and I'm so sorry it was spot on and and the rest obviously sort of worked and it it, uh, it kind of happened. And now Ludovic is everywhere, so now if you do watch it, it seems cheesy. <laughs> but it wasn't cheesy then. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs>
person at the time that I thought there was nothing that I couldn't dig myself out of, you know, and uh, and I didn't have a deep enough spade for that one. So, uh, but yeah, it taught me a lesson. I went, that that was my university with really, making a film without control. So I didn't have control in the, the music that I originally wanted. And so what Dead Man's Shoes is, no one probably would even believe this, but Dead Man's Shoes was the film I was trying to make. Um, and once upon a time in the Midlands, it's not like an appalling thing, but it, when I watch it, I don't see myself. I don't remember shooting it. You know, it's like, it's a really weird thing that you kind of, uh, I realised I needed to be in control, whether it's on a penny budget, you're much better to be in control of something that costs 50 pence then I've no control over 50 million, you know, and doing the Stone Roses proved to me that I could make something big if I wanted to, but I'd have to be in control, you know, so. Have you met Scorsese and you know what he makes of your films? Yeah, he sent me a note, he watched Where's the Money Ronnie, yeah. um, <laughs> and sent me a note, and then I, he was like, he won the, he won a BAFTA at, one of the BAFTA, I can't remember which one it was, and he was walking through and, I, and people do this to me, so you know if you've won an award, there's like, a, you're trying to get out of an arena or wherever you're on, and just this queue of people waiting. And if you've experienced it yourself, you kind of think, and you're watching someone come in and thinking, I can now Scorsese, I've got to speak to him, he sent me this note. And, and you're also sort of thinking, I know what he feels like, because I've been there where you're trying to just go home because you're bollocks. And, and I could see he was like falling to sleep and everyone was going, Martin, you know. And I stopped him and I, and I, and I sort of said, I'm fucking so sorry, mate. I'm, oh, I feel like a massive jerk. I made a film called Where's My Running? And it didn't click at all, you know. It was like, you know, oh, yeah, you know. It was a pleasure to meet you. It was nice, you know. And then he fucking walked about through and went, hey, hold on a minute, where's the money Ronnie? I remember that movie. <laughs> <laughs> and he turned around and came back. And he remembered it. Tonight we're going to be showing, I think you might have heard what Shane Meadows is playing tonight. Yeah, he'll <laughs> <laughs> so, um, be showing some of his shorts uh, after I finish this bit. And then we're going to take a break, go down and have a bit of food, show a few more. Then we're going to have a bit of a Q&A. I'll explain a bit more later about that. Uh, and that's basic structure tonight, so thanks and stuff. Thanks to anyone who's stuck any money down there. We're doing a bit of a thing as well. We'll donate a chunk of the proceeds to the Philippines tonight. Uh, so, do. Um, uh, anyway, just to go through a bit of any old business, as it were. This to the club might remember we had filmmaker Ben Wigley. Uh, <laughs> you should be saying this. You should be saying If you're filming this, we've got, uh, you can edit this bit out. We've got the same uh, thing at the top and bottom. I have no idea where I'm going. There we go. It's called Shane Slides. Is it? That's very sweet of you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so every, one thing will always go wrong every film club. It's a window. There we go. Uh, okay. uh, yeah, this guy, Ben Wigley, uh, he was trying to raise kick, uh, 20,000 pounds on Kickstarter to finish his project. So I was going to say tonight if anyone wants to put rounds in the pocket for him because it finished at 7 o'clock. However, he got it about midday today. Yeah. 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 Uh, if you haven't heard, he's making a film called Pardro and the Lion, uh, which is this guy uh, who makes coffins. Uh, so he's got them on him, so yeah, they look like. He's actually got them well over him as well. Uh, 21 grand. Yeah, I saw it today, yeah. Man, it's it, that he, yeah, nice. he was about 17 this morning. I thought, oh, wait, I'll do a <laughs> So I phoned him and said, I'll, I'll give you a push tonight. But he doesn't need him. So, anyway, he's made a film about. Um, you might know him because he made a film about Paul Smith, so. Um, which we have to show. Shame on me. Yeah. Uh, uh, he autographed it, I didn't actually know, I thought his name was Lee. Uh, 
Google for ages and there were no Google sort of split some of my shorts up into two halves. Uh, the first half is really from the first year that I made short films. Um, you probably know my, my sort of background, but I, I, I got, um, after many years of trying and failing on various courses, acting courses, art courses, um, I finally kind of got my dream um, position of getting out. I, I fell in love with photography, basically, and I found that that was something that I'd got a knack for, and, um, and I got a place at Nottingham and came in for the 92, 90, uh, or 93, 94 year. And, um, and basically, I, I sort of got to college and was doing really well, and I'd, I'd started to get some exams and stuff. And, um, and, and to cut a long story short, it was the first year that they came up with uh, student loans. And uh, there was quite a few workarounds on the student loans, and with me having a sort of part criminal mind, uh, part custard. <laughs> Tart affiliation. I, uh, I couldn't have to take advantage and open a few bank accounts. 
uh, with a few various pseudonyms and, uh, and ended up with about three or four student loans. <laughs> 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 They hadn't, they hadn't sort of shut up. It was like an experiment that they'd started. And obviously, people like myself, who were um, surviving on very little, found a few loopholes. And, um, and at the end of the year, I got called in, and the, the, the head of the course said, you know, your work's fantastic, but you're probably about 20 grand in debt, and um, the government are looking for you. Your electric board and the gas board are looking for you. I think you're going to have to sort yourself out and take a year off, you know. And uh, So I, I literally went back. Um, I, it was literally, and people don't believe this, but I was on my way home from being told that, that you know, it was the end, last day of the term, and I was on my way home, and I was walking back to Snenton from Trent Uni, and come up Heathcote Street, uh, the one behind where the Broadway is, and uh, Intermedia was there at the time, so there was like a, a small crew um, of mainly girls and a lad in a wheelchair. Um, filming something, and mainly young, attractive girls. And, um, <laughs> so I sort of went up and obviously like pretended I was interested, but I was just thinking, what do you have to do to go and do whatever they're doing? Because it's all girls and one lad in a wheelchair. And, and, and likes them on, so now I've got nothing on for the next uh, sort of year or two. And I got talking to this amazing guy called Graham, um, and he was a guy that kind of changed my life really because he, he was dead straight with me. I'm still friends with him now, and he said... Um, you know, basically, you're white, you've got all hands and all feet, uh, you've got absolutely no chance of getting on the course. It's, it's for people from ethnic minorities, for women from you know, various backgrounds, people with disabilities. He said, basically, it's just, you know, you'd need to go to college or do it like that. It's, it's not for someone like you, but, you know, if you're at a loose end, we've just had some lottery money, and you can, um, you can work here as a volunteer over the summer. And so i have gone off with the intention of trying to earn this money to pay my debts off. And ended up sort of walking into, as I always used to, I eh, start college, leave, go and join a band with Paddy Considine, come back to college, got friends with Paddy Considine, got here, here, there and everywhere. And, and I did it again, but this was the time that it kind of stuck, because Graham, um, uh, oh, he could see I had a passion for telling stories in the way I would sit around at lunchtime and relay a story. And uh, obviously I'd got this photography thing that I was in love with, with images, but I'd never put the two things together. And uh, after me working there about three or four weeks, because I was quite good at manual labour and humping stuff up ladders, he lent me a camera one weekend, and my friends had gone away, because, like, their parents lived in Dubai. Mine had been your toxic test, so they, <laughs> <laughs> they went off on a jet in that summer, and I sort of stayed in Snenton. Um, so I made two films on my own, and then the first film that I made with a group of people, I found a load of people who lived up the street that were just around at the time, single parents, a couple of students who'd stayed back. And we made a film called The Datsun Connection. And, um, and so that, that's going to be the first one that I'll show you. And then there's a, like a, just a little progression really through that six or seven months that followed, uh, which, which went, so there's four films that I'm going to show you. Um, Where's the Money Ronnie's in there, but it's got an extended ending that no one ever has ever seen, uh, where Ronnie actually ends up going to prison and getting released from prison and becoming a vicar, which is, there's a reason why it got cut off, obviously, but you can see it. Um, and then there's a, the film that was my first broadcast, which was called King of the Gypsies, which was, I suppose, Where's Money Ronnie and King of the Gypsies are either side of my coin, in a way. You know, Where's Money Ronnie is that growing up with, uh, you know, and falling in love with small-time crooks and, you know, that whole thing of thinking there was a worthy story in there. And then the flip side of someone who'd got an incredible past, a genuine Hollywood story and a bare-knuckle fighter. And I got my first commission. So the, the final one you'll see is, is the first time I ever got any money to make a film. We got about 15 grand, I think, from Channel 4. Um, and it was a local character from Utox that I made that about. Um, obviously, I'll introduce the second half. They're all basically me and Paddy. Uh, Paddy and Shane Shorts after that. But, so the first part is really my progression through that first year from never making a film to get in my first broadcast, so I hope you enjoy them. So, uh, yeah, so basically the, the second part is a collection of shorts that I've made with Paddy, um, and um, I don't think any of them have ever been shot over more than a day. Um, me and Paddy have had this quite incredible relationship where the film that you'll see at the end, which is like it's sort of titled as a mini feature, is uh, you might have seen if you've seen Shane's World, you might have seen some bits from there, uh, but there's some stuff in there that's never been seen. 
and the idea with the it's called the stars of track and field and the idea with that was that we'd we basically I had this big bag of wigs and teeth and guns and things that I'd collected since um, the Datsun connection, this little collection of rubbish props, and I would get Paddy round uh, one day a week, and he would literally just try some things on or do, um, basically pull a wig out, pull a hat out, a set of false teeth, whatever it was, and he would start to sort of look in the mirror and find someone, and we'd work a character up and go out that day, and um, and the first one that you're going to see, which is probably the roughest made. Um, is a very early Le Donc episode. Uh, so, I mean, you know, in 2007 we made Le Donc and Scorsese, but I think in 99 uh, we made the first two episodes of that character and we found him out of this bag. Um, and then there's a film that's never been shown anywhere uh, called Willy Gumbo, which again was part of this same process of finding a location had defining the character, and that's right out there as characters go. And uh, and then I decided to make this little film. It talks about some of it got borrowed for Shane's World, but I think that this is purer in a way. Um, it's called The Stars of Track and Field, and it kind of mimics uh, documentary because I think Paddy's such a good actor that he manages to walk that tightrope, being, being almost even though you know it's Paddy and you know he's playing a character. I think he manages to cross that line of making it feel almost like a real documentary at times. So uh, this is kind of mine and Paddy's journey over about a year from mucking around with the donk, which would like it later become a feature film, um, and uh, it ultimately ended up becoming something called Shane's World, which was broadcast, but these are all the early cuts. Of, so even if you've seen Shane's World, there's cuts in there that you won't have seen, and there's some characters in there that no one's ever seen, so hopefully it'll be all right. <laughs> <laughs>